I, I gave a talk already yesterday, and I was talking, the starting point for that talk was um, work on testing this evolutionary, uh, sorry, the uh, oxidative damage theory of aging. Um, and what I'd like to do, having a, the luxury of a second talk, um, is to talk about something different that starts from the same starting point, but leads into a very different topic, rather, um, I wouldn't have expected a couple of years ago that we'd be working on this, which is the, the question of the mechanisms of organismal death. Um, uh, specifically in, in C. elegans. So this is going to be all about C. elegans. Um, so as I was saying yesterday, one of the uh, 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 major theories in the, in the uh, biology of aging uh, is the molecular damage theory, uh, and particularly the oxidative damage theory. Uh, uh, here, uh, uh, in this particular form, the, the idea that uh, superoxide uh, produced by mitochondria causes damage to, uh, to the cell, and that causes aging. Um, and uh, in the last uh, few years, there have been a lot of um, studies that are suggesting that at least that there are, there are uh, some limits to this theory, uh, that it could at least in some contexts be incorrect. And these are from interventional studies where people have, have manipulated uh, levels of oxidative damage, levels of ROS, to see whether you get the expected effect on lifespan. And the nature of, of the study, so in, in, in the worm, for example, uh, this is work uh, from a number of labs, my lab and that of Siegfried Hekemi and uh, uh, Michael Risto and, and a number of others. So, for example, typically if you treat the worms with antioxidants, they, they don't live longer. Uh, and you can uh, overexpress antioxidant uh, enzymes uh, and not see the expected effects on aging. And you can reduce antioxidant defense and increase levels of damage. Not, and not see the expected acceleration of aging. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you can even increase the oxidative stress levels and you end up with an increase in lifespan. So, um, you know, it's very hard to ever uh, prove the theory wrong, but, but the, the theory seems to have some, some clear constraints. Um, so we kind of got into, uh, into the uh, practice of um, kind of testing every aspect of the theory. Um, and one of the uh, reasons for... Um, thinking that the theory is perhaps true for C. elegans, um, is the accumulation of lipofuscin during aging. So, um, uh, so uh, to tell you about this, I'll need to introduce the, the sort of central topic of the talk, which is uh, the blue fluorescence that you see uh, in C. elegans. So you can see here, is, uh, this is uh, uh, under, the UV, uh, under UV light, you can see the worm shows this blue fluorescence, and this is magnified uh, and it shows that the fluorescence is in the intestine and it's punctate. Um, and uh, it's actually localized to uh, what, what are known as gut granules, which are these quite large uh, lysosome-like organelles in the gut. Um, and this fluorescence has for a long time been equated with mammalian age pigment or lipofuscin. So uh, what is lipofuscin? So uh, in mammals, lipofuscin is well characterized. It's a, it's a product of uh, molecular damage. Uh, it's an aggregate of varying composition, mainly lipids and, and proteins formed by, uh, particularly thought to be caused by oxidative damage. Um, and uh, it accumulates within lysosomes, uh, particularly in post-mitotic mammalian cells. And here's a, it's also autofluorescent, and this, is, this shows blue fluorescence that you see from, uh, from mammalian lipofuscin. Um, and it accumulates with age. So it's been used as a biomarker of aging. Uh, and the mammalian lipofuscin work uh, led to uh, the suggestion that, that the C. elegans blue fluorescence is, is lipofuscin. And there are good reasons for this, uh, this, this suggestion. Uh, one is that, uh, both, that both mammalian lipofuscin and the blue fluorescence in the worm are contained in lysosome-like organelles, the, the gut granules. The spectral properties are quite similar. Um, and when you look at... Uh, population cohorts of worms as they age, the, the blue fluorescence goes up with age. So this is, uh, uh, has been, it would seem as if you have uh, um, this, uh, this product of damage accumulation a, a, a appearing at higher and higher levels with age. Uh, and actually this blue fluorescence is widely used as a marker for aging in C. elegans. There's some 50 or so papers have been published now that use this, use this method. Um, so, you know, Starting from our uh, suspicion about the oxidative damage theory, we uh, we started to uh, we decided to kind of interrogate this idea a bit more carefully, 
And um, in, in mammalian cells, if you treat them with hyperoxia, you can induce uh, increased levels of, uh, of lipofuscin. So uh, this would predict that if you, uh, if you were to treat uh, worms with um, uh, treatments that increase oxidative damage, you should increase the levels of lipofuscin. So we, we used uh, hyperoxia, uh, and we also used uh, uh, a level of iron that we know increases uh, damage levels. And um, here's, this is just the data from um, the, the hyperoxia. And you can see here, this is the, uh, a measure of uh, protein oxidation, uh, protein carbonylation. And you can see that uh, the hyperoxia increases the level of protein oxidation, uh, but it actually decreases the level of, of fluorescence rather than increasing it. And one sees the same effect with uh, using iron uh, as, a, as a form of oxidation. So does oxidative damage increase the elegans of fluorescence? No, it doesn't. Um, so that led us to, to kind of get more suspicious about this. And what we, oops, what's happening here? She's gone to sleep for a moment. What's happening there? Okay, so what we decided to do was to look more closely um, at the idea that the levels of blue fluorescence are going up with age. Um, but we did it slightly differently to previous studies in that we looked at individual uh, animals uh, rather than population cohorts to avoid the confounding effect of, of, uh, of population heterogeneity of the trait. Uh, so we asked uh, whether it increases with age. And what we, so what we did was to look at individual worms maintained in their normal uh, culture conditions on agar plates throughout life. Uh, and then we looked at them daily, measuring their level of movement, the level of fluorescence. Um, now, in worms, you can, you can classify the state of the, uh, of the worm in terms of how, age, how sort of aged it is, uh, in terms of its level of movement. And these have been called class a, B, and C. Actually, I recently found out that uh, gerontologists have a similar classification for humans, which is uh, uh, no goes, slow goes, and no, 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 go goes, no goes, and sorry, go, no goes, slow goes, and, and no goes. That's right. So, um, so the, uh, the, the, the go goes are class A, which is the highly mobile animals. Uh, so we, we, we followed them uh, just by taking photographs, uh, their level of fluorescence. Uh, so these are the slogos, and then the no-gos are the class C animals. Uh, and when they entered the class C, we observed them until the point of death using time-lapse photography. So what happened when we did that? What we found was that, um, in fact, the level of fluorescence in the worms doesn't change through most of their life. It doesn't actually go up with age. And this is actually consistent with an earlier study from the, from the Driscoll lab. Um, but um, what actually happens is that uh, just at the point of death, there's a sudden rapid increase in fluorescence. So these are, value, these are fluorescence values for individual worms, for five individual worms. Um, and if you look at this in detail, what you can see here, this is over uh, uh, the period up, up to the point of death at zero hours. You can see that there's, uh, this, is, this is the intestine of the worm here. You can, this is the anterior of the, the intestine. You can see that there's a, an appearance of this bright blue fluorescence that then spreads down the worm. So if we, uh, if we express this data another way, this is uh, normalizing all the, all the data from a, a lot of worms uh, to a, the, the zero time point of death. You can see that the, there's no uh, change in the blue fluorescence until the point of death. And then you have this great spike of fluorescence. Uh, and so this, this, uh, this spike of fluorescence has a, an average duration of about eight hours. Um, and uh, the average increase in the fluorescence is around uh, 440% with, with that range, and this is highly, highly significant. Um, can we have the lights down, do you think, for this, for this one here? So hang on, stop, stop, don't, don't go yet. Okay, well, well yeah, yeah, we can, uh, we can do it again. Just turn it down. So I, I just want to tell you what you're seeing here. Um, so this is, um, what, what's on this... Uh, in this movie here are a five uh, class C worms. So these worms are alive at the beginning of the film, which covers a period of, I think it's about three hours. Um, and what you'll see is that at the beginning of the film, they're kind of twitching because they're still alive. And you'll gradually see each worm uh, as it kind of gives up the ghost. Uh, it stops twitching and you'll see this bright blue fluorescent burst. So could, could you show the, show the movie? There we go. So they're all kind of twitching around, twitching. And they gradually slow down and you see one by one the blue fluorescence comes up as they die. Okay, thank you. So um, 
The next question we had was, well, when they die of old age, they show this blue fluorescence. Um, and we wondered, is this fluorescent burst characteristic of uh, death from old age only, or is it generally when a worm dies that they show this burst of blue fluorescence? Uh, so this was a very simple experiment involving killing worms and looking at their fluorescence levels. Uh, and we used a number of different methods, including freeze-thaw and heat killing. Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the level that this is a untreated worms, and these are uh, worms killed in, in two ways. And here's a, pic here's a picture of a, a live worm with the fluorescence and a killed worm with the fluorescence. So this, uh, this burst of uh, fluorescence is actually something that happens uh, in general whenever you kill a worm, whether it dies from old age or whether you, it dies um, at any point in its life. We, we looked at larvae. Uh, L4 larvae, we looked in males, so it happens in both sexes, and we looked at a few other species of nematodes, uh, Cenorhabditis briggsiae, and a more distantly related worm, uh, Pristioncus pacificus, and they all show this, this burst. So I can draw some conclusions at this point. Um, the first is, is that uh, a burst of, of blue fluorescence marks organismal death in, in C. elegans, whether from aging or, or induced killing at any age. Um, and uh, the fact that the, uh, this and the fact that the intestinal fluorescence doesn't increase with oxygen damage suggests that it's unlikely to be lipofuscin. So uh, we therefore call this phenomenon death fluorescence. Um, and um, what it seems to be showing is, is that it would seem as if, if this, is, if this is death here that's appearing in the worm, then it would seem as if there's some sort of weak point at the anterior end of the intestine where, where the process of death is initiating and then spreading down the, down the animal. Uh, and this is fairly typical, that not every single death shows this pattern, but the majority of them show this pattern, with the origin in the head and then an anterior to posterior wave of blue fluorescence in the worm. Um, so this brings us on to a slightly different topic. Uh, we, were, we just wondered what this blue fluorescent material is. If it's not lipofuscin, then what is it? Um, and uh, as a starting point to, to get at this, we used uh, a mutant uh, isolated in, in Greg Herman's lab, which is called a glow mutant, which has no gut granules. Uh, so it has no blue fluorescence. And what we were able to do was to compare uh, wild-type worms with control worms and see what chemicals are different between the two. And in fact, we didn't do this. We asked uh, Frank Schroeder and, at Cornell whether he could help with this, and he very kindly uh, 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 collaborated with us uh, taking our extracts and putting them through DANS, differential analysis by 2D NMR spectroscopy. And this is the principle here. You have two different metabolomes and you look for what's different between the two. Um, and this quite rapidly uh, led to the identification of the blue uh, substance. Uh, it's actually a mixture of two compounds which are derivatives of uh, a compound called anthranilic acid. Uh, which is well known to have blue fluorescence of exactly the spectral properties found in the worm. These are actually, uh, I would, w these are likely products of a glucosal transferase action on, on anthranilic acid. So uh, anthranilic acid, what, what is it? It's a catabolite of tryptophan uh, produced through this kynurinian pathway, which is something that's uh, present uh, in, in, in animals up to humans. Um, so, um, and the, the, a number of the genes of the kynurinin uh, pathway are, are, are present in C. elegans, apparently, uh, including this gene here, C28H8.11, uh, which is the putative tryptophan 2,3 dioxygenase, with the first step in the, in the transformation of tryptophan to anthranilic acid. So, as a, as a, a, a kind of a confirmation that uh, the blue fluorescent material in, in, um, in the worm is anthranilic acid, we we knocked down the expression of this gene using RNA-I, RNA-mediated interference. Um, and this is what you get. Uh, this is a, 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 a control worm with the normal fluorescence in the, in the live worm. And this is a worm that's been subjected to RNA-I this, for this gene, uh, 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 encoding the TDO1 enzyme. And this is, this is uh, the fluorescence in the live worms, uh, normalized to wild type. And this is death fluorescence. So in both cases, you knock it right down. Um, for the worm people here, this is actually quite a nice tool because uh, one of the uh, uh, problems with C. elegans, if you're looking at uh, uh, reporter gene expression in the gut, the blue fluorescence is often quite a nuisance because it gets in the way of measuring the, your, your green fluorescent protein or whatever. So now you can simply use RNAi of, of the TDO, 
TD01 gene, and you can knock out the blue fluorescence if you want to. Uh, so con con conclusions of this second bit. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the death fluorescence and the gut granule fluorescence is caused by these anthranilate derivatives. So uh, it, the blue fluorescence is definitely not lipofuscin. So I this is the, the explanation for my slightly silly title. Uh, yes, we have no lipofuscin, uh, which is you know, obviously inspired by the old song, Yes, We Have No Bananas. But it's actually not a very good title because, of course, we haven't shown that the worms don't have lipofuscin. We've only shown that the blue fluorescence is not lipofuscin. And actually, whether worms uh, do have lipofuscin or anything like it uh, remains an open question. Um, so that's sort of as far that, that's as far as this story goes in terms of knocking the, the uh, oxidative damage theory. Um, the third part of the talk, the last part, um, I think is uh, the bit that I think is a lot more interesting than the other part, um, and that led that, that followed from us wondering where this how this death fluorescence is generated, um, and this is a, a difficult, slightly difficult slide to explain because this is one of those points where ruminating over this, over certain bits of data led us to a hypothesis. Uh, and it's easy to misrepresent this rather chaotic process. But we had a number of, of observations. Uh, one was that, um, that the, uh, uh, the death fluorescence intensity was actually affected by pH. So uh, the pH of the worms prior to them being killed. So at low pH, the, uh, the intensity got greater, and at high pH, it got less. Um, and we link that to the fact that the blue fluorescence is initially in gut granules, which are lysosome-like organelles, which have a low internal pH. Um, and uh, the process of necrotic cell death uh, requires uh, a drop in pH, or uh, cytosolic acidosis. And it led us to wonder, um, uh, and, and this is the, the, uh, the cytosolic acidosis is due to the uh, uh, rupture of lysosomes. And it led us to wonder whether there might be some connection between the, this burst of fluorescence and the, uh, the, the, uh, the process of, uh, of cellular necrosis. Um, so this is a, a very quick introduction to, to, to cellular necrosis. So most people are more familiar with uh, the, the apoptotic uh, program cell death. But there's, of course, the second kind of program cell death, which is uh, necrotic cell death, which sometimes people consider as a sort of chaotic process. Uh, but it's far from that. It's, it has a, a, a quite a structured, uh, cascade-like uh, nature. Uh, and uh, the work that I'm going to show you now is built very much on, the, on, on work from um, Nectaris Tavanarakis, who really opened this area up in, in, in the worm. Um, so necrosis starts with a range of, of, of cellular insults, including toxins and uh, ions uh, coming into the cell. Uh, and what, what, it, what happens then is that you get a release of calcium from the ER. Um, and this increase in calcium activates uh, cellular proteases that are calcium sensitive calpeans. And the calpeans, um, uh, they, uh, af they affect the membrane of the lysosome. They actually break it down um, so that the uh, protons within the, the lysosome, because it's very acidic inside the lysosome, uh, leak out into the cell producing cytosolic acidosis. Um, and the drop in pH leads to an activation of acid activated proteases or cathepsins. And these cathepsins then tear up the cytosol. They go around uh, digesting everything right, left, and center. And that leads to cell death. So um, uh, what we did was to say, does, uh, we, we wanted to ask whether necrotic cell death is causing the death fluorescence. And we did that by blocking a series of steps in the pathway. So we could block calcium influx by uh, using a mutation in the, the gene INC16. Uh, we blocked the uh, ER calcium release using these three mutants in these three genes. Uh, we knocked down calpeans using a mutation in TRA3. Uh, we, uh, re we uh, 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 impeded the acidification of the lysosomes using uh, mutations in these two genes. And we also knocked down uh, cathepsins using uh, mutations in these two genes. And we wanted to see whether this inhibits death fluorescence, to see whether necrosis is, is producing death fluorescence. Uh, so here are the results. Uh, so these are the uh, calcium inhibition genes. We, the, this is uh, wild-type worms and the level of, uh, this is all normalized to wild-type 
uh, death fluorescence. So you can see knocking down any of these genes uh, reduces death fluorescence. Also the knockdown calpeans or acidosis or cathepsins. All of them have this effect of uh, reducing the death fluorescence levels. So this is uh, consistent with the idea that the necrosis pathway is generating death fluorescence. Um, so the next thing I'd like to do is just to focus on this particular gene here, INC16, which is a, a very interesting gene. Uh, INC16 is a, a gap junction protein uh, which is required for uh, calcium uh, influx into cells. Uh, and it was, it's been studied uh, in the context of the defecation cycle uh, in C. elegans, where you have an influx of, of calcium into the intestine that moves in a wave along the worm. Uh, and the mutants uh, are defective in this cycle. So this is a picture from a, a, a publication from uh, Peters et al. 2007. Uh, and what this shows, this, is, this shows the level of calcium in the intestine. Uh, and this is a high and a low level. And you can see that there's a wave of increase in calcium uh, during the defecation cycle. Uh, and in the INC16 mutant, the wave fails. Um, and this simply reminded us of the wave of death fluorescence, and it led us to wonder whether actually uh, there's uh, uh, calcium signaling involved in the propagation of this wave. So what we did was to look at worms which uh, lacked INC16 uh, and, uh, and which showed a reduced level of, um, uh, uh, of, of death fluorescence. Uh, and what we found is that if we, if we take these, uh, th this is a wild-type worm here, uh, killed with heat, uh, after one minute and six minutes, you see the death fluorescence starts off at the top of the intestine and then it moves in a wave down the intestine. This is an X16 mutant. We get the initial burst of fluorescence in the head, but it never moves along the intestine. So this is uh, implying that, uh, that the, uh, there's, a, there's actually a, 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 a transmission uh, by a, a X16 of this, uh, this blue fluorescent wave. Um, so we then uh, 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 interrogated the, further the hypothesis that we have a wave of calcium influx, um, which is uh, actually driving the, the, the death fluorescence um, wave. And this we did in collaboration with Keith Nurkey at, at Rochester. The, uh, Eric Ullman did the, the tests. And this is using a, 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 a fluorescent reporter of calcium levels in vivo. Uh, so these are worms that have been killed, and against time, uh, the fluorescence. Uh, you can see uh, two lines here. One of them is the anterior of the worm, and the other is the posterior. And you can see that when the worm is killed, initially the calcium goes up in the anterior end of the worm, and then much later it goes up in the posterior, consistent with the wave of calcium influx into the worm. So this is consistent with our sort of necrotic wave model. Um, uh, he also looked at, uh, at the way that the, uh, the relationship temporally between the influx of calcium and the appearance of death fluorescence. And you can see here that the calcium influx precedes the appearance of death fluorescence. So, so this uh, suggests a causal relationship between the two. Um, uh, Eric and, 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 uh, and Keith also looked at the, uh, the level of pH within the, uh, within the cytosol of the worm. Uh, again, uh, at the, looking at the anterior end of the worm and the posterior. And again, after killing the worm initially, you have uh, a much sharper acidification of the uh, cytosol in the anterior of the worm and then uh, later in the posterior, consistent with, a, with a, a wave of, uh, of acidification. So now just to sort of sum up what, I, what I've just showed you, um, this data uh, implies that cellular necrosis is generating death fluorescence. Um, and that this is associated with a cytosolic acidosis and, and calcium influx. So it seems as if you have an initial burst of necrosis in the anterior intestine propagated in an anterior to posterior wave by calcium signaling. Um, and what I think this suggests is that what we have here is a mechanism of death, of, of uh, organismal death in C. elegans, which is a systemic cascade of, uh, of uh, necrosis. Um, so uh, this is work that's ongoing, uh, it's unpublished, and we've, this is, uh, kind of brings us to where we are at the present, because if this latter is true, then this would predict that if we block 
the mechanism of organismal death, uh, we, we prevent death, then we should see an increase in lifespan. Uh, and peculiarly, it took us a while to think of, of, of asking whether this happened. I guess we were just uh, being unimaginative or too, too much focusing on the earlier stages of the project, maybe. But um, we started to look at this. Um, and this is a, 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 a result that we've replicated a number of times, a, a re very recent finding, uh, which is that um, uh, if we uh, subject worms that are deficient, uh, either in uh, various elements of this uh, necrotic pathway or indeed in uh, um, uh, anthranilate uh, biosynthesis, uh, you, the, work, the animals are protected against uh, death induced by stress. And this is true for heat stress and, and several other stresses. So this is a, these are wild-type worms under severe heat stress. Uh, and these are worms lacking uh, aspartyl protease. Uh, these are worms with no gut granules. These are worms uh, lacking ink 16 with no, without the propagation of, of the necrotic wave. And these are worms lacking the anthranilate. So the anthranilate uh, is, is also uh, would seem to be uh, progressing the death process. It doesn't seem to be a bystander. And by the way, we, we, uh, we have uh, very recent data showing that knocking down uh, the anthranilate production actually increases the lifespan of the worms, although not, not dramatically. Um, so the final conclusions... Um, the uh, blue fluorescence uh, in C. elegans uh, is not a marker of aging, it's a marker of death. Um, and the fluorophore is not lipofuscin. Uh, we can now say that quite for certain because we know what it, what it is. It's a substituted anthranilate. Um, and death fluorescence in C. elegans is actually marking something new, uh, which is uh, a calcium propagated systemic wave of necrotic cell death. Um, so, uh, as I say, the implication is that systemic necrosis is driving organismal death from old age. So what you're actually seeing here, when you look at this blue fluorescence, what this actually, in a way, is marking is death itself. This is actually death happening in real time within the organism. So you can see the dynamics of death as it spreads through the organism. And uh, just to show that one, once more, if you want to, maybe we can, this is just a, a oops, oh, there we go. Not sure what happened there. There we go. Just click that. So that's just another example of the worm. So you can see the anterior end of the worm here, where the blue fluorescence is initially higher, and it's spreading along the, the worm like this as the worm is, is dying. Um, and finally, just to thank the people who did all the work, the, particularly this uh, a graduate student called uh, Cassie Coburn, uh, and our wonderful collaborators, uh, especially the uh, the Schroeder lab and, and the Nerky lab and we've had important input from uh, 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 Zachary Pincus and, and the Brackman lab um, and also just to say if, again if, if anyone is uh, interested in a postdoc in London we have new postdoc positions which we just discovered about uh, about four days ago so if anyone's interested in working either on worms or flies or mice uh, in aging come and talk to me so thank you David, that's fascinating talk, um, but what does it mean in terms of evolutionary theory, this concerted death of a worm? That's a really, thank you very much for asking that, that's a lovely question. So I think there's two interpretations you, you can give to here. Um, you could, one of them is the uh, uh, Misha Blagosklony interpretation, which is that this is a quasi-program. So in other words, cellular necrosis uh, serves a function f uh, that, that somehow in, it enhances fitness early in life um, and it's the, the mechanism is there and it's just triggered in a kind of meaningless way, in a way that has nothing to do with fitness during, uh, at, at the point of death. So in that, in that, by that view, this would be a mechanism very much like the quasi-programmed mechanisms of, 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 of ordinary aging. Uh, but there's another mechanism which I think is uh, actually quite plausible, which is that, um, I mean, one possibility about C. elegans in the wild is that a lot of the time C. elegans is actually undergoing reproductive death. So the worms bag in the wild. So the process of bagging, so this is the process, so, sorry for the non-worm people, the, the, the worms, uh, when they don't have enough food, they withhold their eggs uh, and the eggs hatch inside mum. 
and then the, the, the larvae eat mum. So the, the nutrients that are present in the mum go to the, to the offspring, and one could imagine that that's good for fitness. So it could be that this necrotic death is actually designed to free up the resources uh, to nourish the, uh, the larvae in the bagging mothers. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> so um, somehow the causes of death and uh, causes of aging are not often discussed uh, at meetings. And I don't know why, because it's so important. And so thank you very much for bringing these que uh, questions to discussion. The funding agencies don't like to fund this. If you ask to, about to, to sort of describe, do descriptive work on pathology of aging in fruit flies or in worms, they, they, they don't get too excited. They say it's irrelevant. So I, I, I agree with the problems with the oxidative stress uh, theory of aging. But uh, I think many of the contradictions can be resolved if um, oxidative uh, damage can be replaced with simply damage. So oxidative damage would be just one type of damage. And uh, for example, inducing oxidative damage, you could uh, repress other damage or increase other damage. And including blue fluorescence, which could be just one type of the damage, which would not be represented. Well, I quite agree. I, I mean, I think it's, it seems pretty much impossible ever to disprove the oxidative damage theory or alternatively that other forms of damage are causing aging. So, I mean, in terms of the, the relevance of this to, to, to the theory, I think that the, I would say that because people think so much in terms of molecular damage as a cause of aging, that's how they leapt to the conclusion that this blue fluorescence was lipofuscin. You see what I mean? I think, I think when you think within a certain framework, it affects how you interpret your data. But once you kind of have the freedom to sort of put that framework aside for a moment, then you can start seeing the, 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 the frailty of some of your assumptions. So, David? Yeah. Uh, ah, they give me a frightening question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice question, I think. But uh, I was wondering if you, con if you have considered what the origin of the death wave is, what is the triggering factor? And why does it always originate at the posterior? Is there something happening there that, that, that triggers this wave? Because I, I, you said that it originates in the posterior, but I saw in one of, the, of your videos that there's also an initiator side somewhere in the middle. So, it, it, I mean, I, was, uh, I, I tried to be upfront about that. It varies. It varies. Um, the most common pattern is that it originates in the, in the head. But sometimes you get... Uh, another kind of point of origin in the mid-body as well. Uh, and occasionally it, it, it appears in a, it, it, it doesn't follow that pattern. Um, but I mean, right, because, you know, this is all about first causes. If that's death, what actually, what actually starts it off? Um, and one thing that uh, Keith Nurki uh, uh, found looking at uh, elderly worms uh, in terms of the pH uh, in, in the cell is that, is that um, prior, some time prior to, the, uh, uh, to death, there is a slow acidification of the, uh, uh, of this, of the anterior uh, intestinal cells. So, I mean, I think in a way, uh, uh, if you try to kind of think back to the primary cause of it all, I would say if I had to kind of propose something, it's the, loss, it's the gradual loss of membrane integrity particularly the, the, the uh, apical membrane of the intestinal cells and the lysosomal membrane. They gradually lose integrity, and it's, it's when, you know, in a way it's almost, uh, if you have to define when an organism, when a cell dies, it's when it loses membrane integrity, then, then the cell is finished. And I think this, this, there seems to be a gradual loss of membrane integrity at the end of life. So, if you, uh, thank you. Have you looked in mammalian tissue where necrosis has been induced? To see if you see any of this thing through it. Well, we've we've been sort of looking. We we did a few tests with, with um, somebody at UCL, and we don't we don't see the blue fluorescence. I mean, we've been looking through the literature, um, and you do. There are reports in uh, in tissue that have where you have you know, for example, ischemia and you have extensive necrosis, that there are increases in blue fluorescence, but mostly the chemical basis for that isn't known. But this is an interesting question. It's also worth bearing in mind that, that the blue fluorescence is something that um, that's, you see in the worm only in the intestine. So for example, in, in the, uh, you, you, you see a necrosis in some neurons in, in the worm, uh, and in those worms you don't see the blue fluorescence. So I mean, possibly this is something specific to nematodes, I don't know. Oh. Uh, 
Did you try alloy twist tricks? Ah, no, we didn't, but um, we have looked at the DAF2 and DAF16 worms. Uh, and the DAF2 actually greatly reduces the level of death fluorescence, and the DAF16 increases it. So there's clearly, an, there's clearly some sort of crosstalk overlap between the two. <laughs>